Okay, um, we're very happy to uh, have this uh, kind of last panel, but not least in any way. Uh, we're having with us uh, Evan Criddle from the William and Mary Law School in Virginia. Uh, Evan is uh, studied, uh, studies public international law, international human rights, administrative law, civil procedure, and the law of fiduciaries, and is working a lot uh, with Evan Fox's dissent on the law of fiduciaries in um, international law, and uh, also Elia Vliblich from uh, uh, IDC Herzliya uh, Law School, who works on public international law, international law on the use of force, international humanitarian law, human rights, and, um, and recently uh, pu published a book titled International Law and Civil Wars, Intervention and Consent. Um, okay, so, Evan. Hey, thank you. Well, I'm very uh, grateful for the invitation um, to present today. Um, grateful uh, in particular to be here to uh, meet um, Professor Ben Venisti's work. I've been a great fan of for some time and I'm uh, grateful uh, to learn that um, that Gandhi also was a fan of the trustee model, which I think is the ultimate trump card in debate, so I plan to use that frequently. Um, however, um, our conveners have, have given me a formidable task, um, uh, both uh, going last, but also because I'm following Andrew, who I think has sketched out uh, the, uh, the critique of the, the trustee model in a very um, uh, clear and direct way. Um, and my paper, is picking up on this tradition of looking at um, humanitarian intervention from the trusteeship model perspective um, and considering whether there are things that we can learn from this um, as look, developing a trusteeship model or fiduciary model um, that may actually shape future debates over humanitarian intervention, the extent to which the model may actually provide a model for contemporary discourse. Um, and so it's it, clearly I've got my work cut out for me after uh, what, what's preceded me during this conference. Um, so obviously this goes back to Vittoria. We've seen that um, in uh, Andrew's presentation. Um, I'm drawn to Grotius, um, a Grotius contribution to the tradition for several reasons. First, uh, his contribution has been particularly influential. Uh, it was influential in um, sh shaping how subsequent uh, publicists thought about humanitarian intervention, uh, Pufendorf, Vittel, and others. Um, it's also uh, been influential in contemporary practice, as I'll discuss in just a second. But second, I, I'm drawn to Grotius be think, because I think he uh, elaborates a very lucid juridical theory of humanitarian intervention. Um, and it's one that I think uh, ex explains the legal basis, the structure, the scope of state uh, authority to protect human rights abroad. Um, and, and third, I'm attracted to Grotius because his theory of humanitarian intervention gets almost no play in contemporary debates about humanitarian intervention. Um, and I think that's a mis mistake because I think that um, his theory has some important lessons for current practice. So my paper's an attempt to kind of flesh that out. So starting with Grotius may seem a little counterintuitive here, um, in part because Grotius is much better known for his theory of punishment than he is for his theory of humanitarian intervention. So. Um, Grotius argued that all members of international society were entitled to punish violations of natural law, irrespective of uh, where or against whom they might occur. So the idea is that violations of natural, of natural law cry out for punishment. There's a need to, for punishment to vindicate the law's authority and systemic integrity. Um, and under Grotius' understanding of uh, international law, we today consider international law, the need for punishment is enough to generate authority. Um, obviously, this is a view that, that Locke would later uh, embrace and extend. Um, and punishment could include the use of force. Um, indeed, Grotius points to the use of force, to war, as a primary mechanism in the international system for punishment. And that, that mechanism, that tool, can be used uh, by any state that has uh, relatively clean hands. Um, and because basic standards of humane treatment are part of the natural law in theory, what we today can characterize as at least some human rights are part of the natural law that are subject to universal punishment. Um, Grotius offer, offers cannibalism as an example. Um, so we may think that maybe this is just a dim historical curiosity. Um, it's based on natural law concepts that perhaps no longer hold the same currency today. Um, but it continues to have relevance for a couple of reasons. One is, um, well, we see that states continue to assert a universal right to punish in 
the uh, field of universal jurisdiction. So there's thought to be a universal right to punish individuals who violate certain types of uh, grave human rights uh, norms. Um, focuses on individual punishment, um, and it's thought to, to rest on customary international law, but there's still a flavor of this idea of the, um, the gravity of the norm having something important to, to say about the universal right to, to exercise authority. And second, we also see assertions of a universal right to, pun uh, to use force to punish states in response to certain types of international law violations. We saw this most clearly last fall uh, when the United States and the United Kingdom threatened a military strike against Syria in response to use of chemical weapons. So uh, exactly one year before, President Barack Obama had announced that if chemical weapons were used in Syria's civil war, that would be a red line. Crossing that red line would entail a response from the United States so unspecified. When the line is crossed, I um, have here a quote from Prime Minister David Cameron who says, this is not about wars in the Middle East. It's not even about the Syrian conflict. So he's saying this is not about, um, about concern for uh, the, the actual uh, uh, facts on the ground, ameliorating the, the harm that's, that's taken place. Rather, he says, it is about the use of chemical weapons and making sure as a world we deter their use and we deter the appalling scenes that we've seen on, on our television screen. So this is forward-looking. It's deterrence, it's a punitive conception of the use of force now for kind of broad humanitarian purposes. But this has some resonance, I think, with the Groshen tradition of punishment. Um, interestingly, this argument was widely rejected by international legal scholars, aside from a couple of um, people within um, the, the relevant governments, our former government officials, uh, Harold Coe, I think, um, was one who came out in um, the blogs and talked about, uh, sort of defended this idea. But generally speaking, this was not widely accepted. Um, you know, for a couple of reasons. One is the thought is perhaps that uh, from, as a matter of sovereign equality, perhaps one state lacks the authority to punish another under contemporary international law. Perhaps there just isn't a customary norm um, that uh, generally that would support this kind of punitive uh, use of force. It's maybe inconsistent with the UN Charter, et cetera. Um, so, um, so it's an awkward fit with practice, um, and it's an awkward fit with um, international legal theory, at least in sort of mainstream theory currently. Um, so uh, it's interesting, though, that, that this isn't Grotius' main theory of humanitarian intervention, although it tends to be one we, we associate most cl clearly with Grotius. Rather, Grotius' thought of um, humanitarian intervention has a form of fiduciary relationship. Rather than um, conceptualize human rights as, as state rights or community rights, the Grotian tradition suggests that we need to take international human rights seriously on their own terms as human rights. States may use force to protect these rights under some circumstances, um, but only as fiduciaries for foreign nationals whose rights they are, that is, exercising rights of resistance that are paired with um, uh, the, the, the right to be free from certain kinds of grave mistreatment. So what do we mean by states intervening as fiduciaries? Um, Fiduciaries in, in general uh, private law um, arise in contexts where one party, the fiduciary, exercises discretionary power or the practical or legal interests of another, whom we designate the beneficiary. Um, this often involves the exercise of legal rights on behalf of another. We can think about a trustee managing property for the beneficiary or agents entering into contracts for principals, a lawyer handling, handling legal claims on behalf of their clients who uh, possess those legal claims. But the overarching conception here is that the standing of the fiduciary to exercise these rights or power is derivative. It's derived from the legal personality of, um, of the beneficiary or perhaps the entrustor and trust uh, relationships. Um, and fiduciary law is concerned with ensuring that the fiduciary lacks the authority under international law to set the terms of the relationship with the beneficiary unilaterally. So it's guaranteeing, going back to what something Evan said earlier, the equality, um, uh, talking uh, legally guaranteeing the equality of the party who exercises unilateral discretionary power and the other who's vulnerable to that uh, exercise of power. Um, so the law imposes duties of loyalty and care, um, among others that are designed to address that vulnerability and ensure that domination is precluded by law. Well, Grotius argues that this, this explains the juridical character of humanitarian intervention as well. 
And I think this is one reason why um, the fiduciary account of humanitarian intervention has been very influential um, and attractive, particularly for international lawyers, um, because it offers a juridical conception, um, one that's not simply based on sort of ethical norms. Um, and it's, it's one that responds to this ultimate concern about the vulnerability and domination. To understand this, we have to unpack Grotius' theory uh, of natural law a little bit. So Grotius, as I mentioned before, believed that natural law pro prohibited um, states from gr gravely mistreating their own people, from ac ac exercises of grave cruelty. But he also believed that people collectively lacked the legal capacity under natural law to exercise the kind of coercive powers that allowed them to rise up in resistance, barring, except in situations where this is built into this, the con, uh, an original um, consensual contract, as Benjamin discussed yesterday. It, but in the ordinary situation, a people lacks authority. They've given over that authority to the state. Um, so they lack the capacity to assert those rights, although they have a right um, to be treated humanely, and indeed a right of resistance in theory, just one that can't be exercised as a matter of capacity. Well, Grotius sees this as this is intolerable, um, domination, I'm sorry, perhaps you wouldn't use the term domination, but a vulnerability. Um, the solution he finds in the idea that other states, which have the capacity to use force internationally, but lack the right to do so, can intervene as fiduciaries exercising that right on behalf of a people that lacks the capacity. Um, so because states stand in a fiduciary relationship, they're they're not required to engage in humanitarian intervention. They, they don't have a responsibility to protect individually in the sense, you know, contemporary discourse. But it's permissible to do so on a voluntary basis, uh, pr provided that they do so in a fiduciary capacity. Once that, that authority is assumed and exercised, uh, the fiduciary responsibilities um, attach and um, power has to be uh, exercised in the right way. Now, I'm not going to defend Grotius' view that people lack capacity to resist cruelty, to resist human rights violations. I think that's not something that we, from a contemporary perspective, would necessarily share. Um, we don't have to infantilize human beings or peoples in order to find value in gar Grotius guardianship account. Uh, here's where I see the value coming in. Um, Grotius theory uh, tells an intriguing story about the former legal structure of humanitarian intervention that has some contemporary parallels. Um, under international law today, individuals and groups lack the practical capacity ordinarily to use force for the purpose of vindicating their own human rights effectively. So ordinarily, um, a people must, in, in these situations, look to their own state to take action on their, their, their behalf. But where the state is in some way the, the violator or complicit in human rights violations, victims are often per, um, helpless to protect their own human rights. So under these circumstances, international law authorizes states under some circumstances to serve as fiduciary representatives for oppressed peoples for the purpose of using force and collective self-defense on their, in their behalf. Um, and here I want to just take as a tangent, suggest we can think of this as being more than mere metaphor. This has been one of the questions that's, I think, arisen over this conference. Is the fiduciary conception of state authority a me metaphor, or is it something more? Um, what I would argue, and I think Evan and I make this, make this point in our work, is that this is more than metaphor. That is, every fiduciary relationship in some sense is built on metaphor, that is from the original conception of trust to agency to corporation. But the metaphor is based on certain structural pr pr uh, features of these relationships um, that are common to all the relationships that qualify them as fiduciaries. And, and the legal structure of state authority and humanitarian intervention or state power is similar. Um, that states assume this in an entrusted fashion for the benefit of others. It has the features of the, the powers other regarding purposeful institutional uh, in terms that are discussed in Evan's paper. And that structure hasn't gone away, um, although uh, the, re the rhetoric of fiduciary obligation has, I think, been buried in international legal theory. And there are good and there are historical reasons for this. Right? We understand that there's, um, there's a legacy that's associated with this that's caused um, international lawyers to retreat from it. But even so, if we look at the actual structure of what states are doing in humanitarian intervention, we have to see that it bears this, these characteristics of a fiduciary relationship. So we might ask, though, in, in practice, what difference does it make if we characterize a relationship as fiduciary or humanitarian intervention as having fiduciary ca capacity, or is it some kind of punitive power or police power? Isn't the outcome the same? Does it really matter? 
Let me suggest a couple of ways why I think it might matter. First, um, again, it points to the importance of, of human rights and the rights that are being vindicated, the interests that are being vindicated in those terms, as the interests of human beings and not the interests of the state that's intervening, and not even the inter interest of the inter international community in some kind of more abstract way. Um, and so it highlights the, what, what AL yesterday described as sort of the democracy problem, we might say the re representation problem, that in intervention there is that potential slippage, the agency problem uh, of a state that intervenes. Second, it highlights the role of states as opposed to international community intervention. There's a broad misconception that it's the international community as a whole that intervenes, or perhaps it's the Security Council that intervenes, when in fact what actually happens, uh, you know, at least over the last 25 years in humanitarian intervention, um, uh, at least as dictated by the Security Council, um, has been states coming to the Security Council, petitioning to take action, and then getting authorization from the Security Council to take action. But it's states that are, ta are taking the action, not the Security Council. There's an entrustment of authority, discretionary authority for the purpose of protecting human rights. Um, the uh, intervention in Libya, I think, being in 2011, um, being a good example of, of this phenomenon. Um, so, um, now obviously, there, we've got the, the dilemma here is how do we respond um, to the, the criticisms that we've already discussed in some detail in the conference. First is the conceptual one. Um, the the Grotius theory of guardianship is an obvious tension with notions of self-determination. So Grotius conceptualizes the beneficiary as, um, well, in C.S. Lewis's terms, an, an innocent, an imbecile, or something along these lines. Um, and so there's a risk of imposing one state's subjective values on another. There's a historical legacy. Um, Grotius is not um, he's not uh, uncognizant of this. Um, Benjamin yesterday read the quote. Um, I'm going to write, read it in a different translation. We know from both the ancient and modern history that the desire for which is another seeks such pretext as this for its own ends, but a right does not at once cease to exist in case it, it is to some extent abused by evil men. Pirates also sail the seas, arms are carried also by brigands. This seems to, to be um, well, he, the sense that it's not. Um, the power that is the problem, it's how the power is being used, which has a certain intuitive appeal. On the other hand, as we look at history and we see that pirates and brigands are no less likely to invite, invoke humanitarianism and perhaps more likely to do so, it should cause uh, some concern. Um, so why should we put our, tr our trust in the fiduciary concept? Um, again, going back to the conceptual reason, conceptually, um, I think fiduci the fiduciary concept uh, identifies the core structure of this relationship, it, but moreover, it explains how these unequal relationships, which would otherwise be domination, can be something other than that, at least in a formal legal sense, by supplying principles, legal principles, duties that prevent unilateralism and, infor uh, and strengthen fidelity to beneficiaries. So this is preferable, I think, to a world in which uh, we have some kind of supranational uh, police force. Um, which could, as Ann Orford has, has um, emphasized, can be a, thor a form of authoritarianism in itself, uh, unless it, it's tempered by the fiduciary principle, which is another, um, another discussion. Um, historically, also, I think we're in a unique position, in a unique position, and um, the fiduciary principle was never taken particularly seriously in practice until perhaps the 20th century, and even then, it's taken time to develop the institutional mechanisms that would be necessary in order to enforce it, to put power in the hands of the beneficiaries to enforce it in international fora. So I think there's a greater hope today, perhaps, with the proliferation of international tribunals. There are more institutional mechanisms that are available. Perhaps there's greater opportunities for social mobilization than there may have been uh, a couple of hundred years ago. Um, but that doesn't necessarily, that's not um, the end of the story. Obviously, there's more that needs to be done uh, I think positively to change international law and international institutions to bring them in line with the fiduciary conception of the state. So in the paper I suggest three you know, possible, possible um, uh, reforms that might, might be appropriate. I don't think these are exhaustive. Um, obviously I'm only sketching them out, but I think they're illustrative and suggestive. Um, the first is a duty of deliberative engagement. Um, so. Uh, there needs to be a greater effort to take the victim's point of view. Um, now, this is something that 
proponents of R2P have suggested, but they've generally done it in, from the perspective of saying we need to take, make, make a greater effort to empower peoples to, to protect human rights, to ha have the capacity to prevent grave abuse. Whereas I think the fiduciary co concept says that even in the exercise of intervention, there needs to be deliberative engagement. Um, so I think that, that the lawyer-client relationship offers an interesting paradigm. Um, the duty con to consult on the nature of defense, that the client needs to agree with that defense. The lawyer is limited by the client's instructions. This kind of deliberative relationship is one that takes seriously the autonomy, um, the uh, non-derivative character of the, um, the beneficiary's uh, legal interest. Um, and attempts to respond to that. I, I think we can see some movement. Evans already identified some movement in this direction in other areas, indigenous rights, perhaps the law of diplomatic protection, at least normatively. There's some movement in the direction of suggesting that states need to actually consult with nationals whom they purport to represent in international fora. Um, but m m my view is that, that there needs to be some effort to actually consult with to take seriously the actual values and preferences of beneficiaries to deliberate with when possible. When not possible, um, there needs to be reason just justification, public de deliberation that makes the international community a secondary guarantor. Um, so a second uh, change that I think needs to happen, or at least um, way that this fiduciary model suggests um, uh, some uh, prescriptive uh, 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 possibilities is thinking about the tension between international human rights law and international humanitarian law during humanitarian intervention. So um, there is uh, has been a very lively, vigorous de uh, debate between uh, legal scholars over the last 10 years, and perhaps longer, about how international human rights law and humanitarian law relate to one another. So. In international humanitarian law, there's, uh, we have the principles of, of distinction and proportionality. Dis dis distinction says you need to make an, can't target uh, civilians, um, but uh, we can target um, combatants um, freely. Um, and uh, pr 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 principle of proportionality says to the extent that we're, we're targeting combatants, we need to take care that any use of force is not excessive in relationship to the military necessity. Human rights law has a different perspective. Human rights law says any use of force needs to be strictly necessary. Um, and uh, that means even a use of force against one who has taken up arms. Um, so it's much more restrictive. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm perhaps uh, oversimplifying a little bit and there are debates about how these, these integrate. But I think that the fiduciary concept suggests this, to the extent a state is intervening for the purpose of protecting human rights, um, it, that it's being put in a position where it, it, it must be required to apply human rights principles. Um, that, that, that taking each of the people of the state that's affected as an equal beneficiary of its power is one that is entailed in the fiduciary concept. Moreover, it seems that this should, should apply um, to situations um, even where the intervening force does not have effective control. And this is important because in some of the most um, oft, uh, debated and discussed uh, examples of humanitarian intervention for the last two decades, states have intervened without putting boots on the ground. That is, we've had um, aerial bombardment, right, uh, and, uh, which is, is specifically an, e an effort to change the dynamic on the ground without having effective control. So unless we define effective control somewhat broadly, which is kind of beyond the traditional understanding, this is not effective control. Nonetheless, the extent that a state is using force um, and it's claiming authority to do so, then the fiduciary principle would suggest that, um, that the, the same requirements of human rights proportionality should apply. Um, a third possible prescriptive um, contribution is uh, the need for oversight and we might think that there's need for oversight uh, uh, from other perspectives, but the fiduciary theory emphasizes, I think, that fiduciary relationships are always about the relationship between a principal, a beneficiary, and the courts. There always has to be some, some institution that's capable of mediating this relationship to ensure that 
that the, the law, uh, the legal norms are ones that are, are credible. Well, there's, there's an enforcement gap, arguably, in humanitarian intervention. Um, there's a need for a credible enforcement mechanism. So um, we might say that civil society may have some role to play here. Um, human rights scholars argue that human rights are best enforced, more, most powerfully enforced, through social norms, through the mobilization of shame, rather than through formal mechanisms. And this is analogous to the idea that fiduciary obligations are best enforced through social uh, socialization processes. This is something that's common in the private law scholarship. Um, nonetheless, that, that can't be the end of the story. Um, and it seems that in, in contemporary international um, order, the Security Council is the institution that's best situated to perform this role. It has to be part of the equation, uh, both because it entrusts authority to states and because it's best, best situated to withdraw that authority or to limit the authority. But for a variety of practical reasons, it's not very well positioned to do that. Um, but not the least of which is because it's very difficult for the Security Council, having granted authority, often to re retract that authority because typically, uh, if it's been granted, it's because one of the members of the Security Council has, a str has either taken on the responsibility or has, uh, is, um, is strongly aligned with the, 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 the state that has, um, which makes the, the possibility of veto tr threat a serious obstacle to, to accountability. So we might say, well, maybe we just need to blow up the Security Council and there's a need for more radical reform, and um, I'm happy to entertain thoughts about that. Um, what I've suggested in the paper is two more modest steps. One is the possibility of uh, uh, um, attaching some kind of line, line item veto type uh, procedure to resolutions that authorize humanitarian intervention, perhaps authorizing some kind of committee composed of Security Council me uh, uh, members that could supervise humanitarian intervention and perhaps withdraw or, or, or limit the scope of authorization as um, as the intervention continues. Another possibility is having sunset provisions. So saying, uh, we're going to authorize humanitarian intervention for this period of time within the scope. Um, if at the end of this time, uh, there's a continued need for humanitarian intervention of some sort, we'll revisit that, po that possibility. We'll either reauthorize or we'll, we'll not reauthorize. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll consider different possibilities, but there's going to be a need to come back and, and report on um, the, the actual performance. This seems to me a, a a powerful and perhaps potentially attractive approach. Um, so anyway, the bottom line here is, I think um, that while the fiduciary theory is very, uh, it's freighted, we certainly know it's susceptible to abuse, there are good reasons to be concerned about it. Nonetheless, I think it best captures the legal structure of how humanitarian intervention actually works. And if taken seriously, and if we have the institutional mechanisms that are necessary to to give credibility to the norms and to provide for for beneficiaries, for oppressed peoples to have voice in the process, uh, that may be the best way to actually um, to actually help to reform humanitarian intervention to move beyond its despotic proclivities. <laughs>